I'm Cindy Kelly, Atomic Heritage Foundation from Washington, D.C. And it is Tuesday, January 14, 2014. And I am here with Adrian Lowry, who was married to Joseph Kennedy, um, a, a radio chemist with the Manhattan Project. And Adrian, let's start with you. Can you tell us um, your name? Say your name and spell it, please. Oh, my name is Adrian Kennedy Lowry. Adrian is spelled A-D-R-I-E-N-N-E. -N -N -E. And uh, Lowry is spelled L-L-W-R-Y. And you were formerly married to Joseph Kennedy, is that correct? Yes. We were married in 1942 in California. Okay. Well, let's, let's just start with um, a little bit about you and when, where and when you were born. I was born in California, Northern California, near, near San Francisco, on a farm, Santa Clara County, uh, 2 to 22. Uh -huh. And, um, and uh, my family uh, lived for a while in uh, first Los, Alam Los Altos, and then we moved to Tascadero, and then we moved to Santa Barbara. And um, I grew up in Santa Barbara, uh, graduated from high school there in, uh, 90, in 30, 39, and uh, went to Berkeley as a student. What were you studying at Berkeley? I majored in public health. and. Uh, it was a very interesting major because it exposed me to a variety of sciences. And uh, I had to take physiology and zoology and physics and chemistry. <laughs> Joe was my instructor in uh, freshman chemistry. Uh, the professor was uh, a G. N. Lewis, a famous chemist. And uh, I, 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 I was exposed to physics and bacteriology and uh, physiology, huh, psychology. So I got a big exposure of science. So did you like chemistry? Um, it was difficult for me, <laughs> but... Um, I liked the instructor. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so how did that um, end up? You're a student then at Berkeley from 38 or 39? 39. 39. To 43. The uh, beginning of 43. We, we went to Los Alamos at the very beginning, January. So um, what what brought you to Los Alamos? Oh well, uh, Oppenheimer needed uh, asked Joe to be division leader for the chemistry uh, division, um, and to bring um, a team of workers to set up uh, uh, the section in the tech area for work on chemistry, whatever it was, I didn't know because everything was top secret. So what, what um, brought him to Oppenheimer's attention? Why did Oppenheimer choose him? What had he been doing? Oh, he'd already discovered plutonium by that time. Uh, he'd gotten his PhD at Cal and then worked with um, the other three scientists who were involved in the discovery of plutonium. Um, Emilio Segre was a physicist. Seaborg, 
Glenn Seaborg, and then Art Wall was a graduate student. Art Wall's PhD thesis was about um, the purification of plutonium, I think. His thesis is, had been uh, uh, top secret for years. It was not published for anybody to see in the public. But, um, but they were all working together at Berkeley. And uh, Oppenheimer asked Joe if he would be willing to go to Los Alamos. And uh, of course he said yes. It was very interesting getting to Los Alamos at that time because it was still in a big construction mode. The, um, uh, we didn't have housing right away. We, we stayed in the boys dorm at uh, Los Alamos and that was an experience. Um, everybody was put to work when they got there. Uh, and um, there was a, a, a wonderful woman, Rose Beta, was assigned to the housing. And she assigned everybody a place to live. <laughs> but, uh, um, she, um, she also was, uh, her husband was Hans Beta, a very famous physicist and a wonderful man, a Hungarian. And um, I don't know where they came from. Cornell, I believe. Uh, and uh, we stayed in the boys' dorm until uh, we had a place to live. And we were then moved to a duplex army construction, wartime construction, which was all the type of housing that was there at Los Alamos. Um, the the uh, person who lived in the other half of our duplex was uh, Professor Inglis and his wife, Betty. And I don't know from where they, they were from the East Coast. They had an interesting experience moving into their duplex. They were evidently sailors. They had a sailboat where they came from. And Betty had very carefully told what the movers needed to send to Los Alamos and what needed to be put in storage. Well, it didn't end up that way. She ended up in Los Alamos with a bunch of sailing equipment. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it's a little bit awkward. <laughs> Do you remember the boys' dorm? Was it called the Big House? The Big House, yes. And uh, there was a cook who prepared our meals, army type. I must say the food was not particularly inspiring. Um, but um, it was okay. The design of the housing was very, very satisfactory. Uh, when I got pregnant, uh, I moved across the lane to a uh, four apartment, two-story building. Um, I li we lived upstairs uh, above the Lipkins. The Lipkins, who was a chemist, uh, lived downstairs with his wife, Shirley. Uh, next door to us upstairs was Diz Graves, and I think her husband's first name is Al, but I'm not sure. Al Graves was one of the fellows that got seriously burned in that, um, that radiation um, accident that occurred at Los Alamos. Do you know about that? Uh, that was with Louis Slotin. What, what was his name? Uh, Louis Sloton. Stroke, yes. Yes, well, Al Graves got seriously burned, and he, uh, but he recovered from the uh, exposure. 
He lost all of his hair and everything, but he fortunately recovered. He was our close next door neighbor in this four apartment dwelling. The fourth person family was the Jorgensons, I believe, and I think they were from Sweden. There were a great many people at Los Alamos that were from Europe. Uh, How did that work out? It worked out, well, they were all, they were all dedicated scientists and they all worked terribly hard. They took their job very, very seriously. It's amazing we were at Los Alamos only three years, but to me it seemed almost like 30. We were all so intense at that time. Uh, and of course, the uh, United States was in the war and that was uh, very strenuous. The, um, but everybody worked extremely hard during that three year period. So. Would that be um, six days a week or? Well, well actually five days a week, but if they needed to, they would have uh, meetings on the weekends and so on. Um, on weekends, uh, we couldn't do very much we, uh, because of gas rationing. Uh, we went on picnics up to the Via Grande, which was a spectacular place to see. Unbelievably beautiful. And a lot of other people explored uh, the nearby territory in, in uh, New Mexico, explored the Indian ruins, and. Uh, went fishing, and but uh, we were fairly limited to doing much because of gas rationing. We could get down to Santa Fe once a month on what we were allowed. We had a C rating. Um, the other thing that was rationed, of course, was food. Uh, we got our food from a commissary, a um, military-run commissary. Um, I remember we were privileged to a certain amount of army issue, um, non-rationed meat like uh, canned bacon and C-grade beef, and uh, but sugar was rationed like everybody else at that time. The, uh, we all had jobs when we got there. I was assigned to the uh, switchboard. <laughs> I had to learn how to work the switchboard. That didn't last very long because someone came in who was a pro. Then I was assigned as the mail carrier and uh, I had to be driven to Santa Fe twice a day, and I was driven by a 16-year-old boy, and our bus was an old uh, station wagon, one of those station wagons that had wooden sides, if you remember that particular model, that goes back. Was driving down that hill on the narrow gravel dirt road with lots of switchbacks and uh, quite steep, it was a, it was slightly uh, harrowing uh, to do this trip to Santa Fe. I had a briefcase padlocked to my belt for the um, confidential mail that I was to pick up. I had a bodyguard who was a Spanish American and spoke only very little English and. Um, he uh, wore a gun around his waist on a belt and uh, followed me to where I had to go to the post office and so on. And uh, uh, you know, it was protecting me for who knows what. 
it was amusing walking with, uh, I think his name was Juan Lujan, walking with Juan in downtown Santa Fe because he had friends that were around in the streets and I remember his making comments to his friends and uh, I couldn't understand what they were saying. Who knows what they were saying? But anyway, he was my bodyguard. And that lasted <laughs> until the military police finally arrived and the MPs then took over the mail carrying. Mail was um, censored. It went, all our mail went through the University of California. Uh, you know, we were limited to what we could say. We weren't supposed to tell our parents where we were or our relations. We um, couldn't say where we were in our mail. Uh, we couldn't subscribe to magazines because I didn't want a list of several scientists' names appearing on the um, subscription list of magazines, all these magazines being sent to P.O. Box 1663, uh, just for security reasons. So. That was a restriction. We also had driver's licenses without our name on them. We just had a number on our driver's license. Um, and of course, to get into Los Alamos, you had to go through uh, a checkpoint and you had to have a, a badge. And then to get into the tech area, you had to have another kind of clearance. After I stopped being mailman, I got a job in the library at Los Alamos. And uh, that was interesting. The library was set up by Charlotte Serber, and she did a fantastic job. She had to educate herself about the Library of Congress uh, Dewey decimal system or other about how books were cataloged and everything. And the whole library was built up from scratch and she was responsible for that. And everybody did a fantastic job. Her husband was a physicist. Um, so what kind of books were in the collection? Oh, there were scientific books. Um, I remember a peculiar uh, occasion, experience. I was typing up uh, cards um, for the books to be cataloged, and I was trying to decipher the writing of the people who were, had requested this book, and the expression P.U. kept appearing in the writing and description of the literature. And I, having had tech, chemistry, I didn't remember any PU. <laughs> and so I asked my husband what it was in that afternoon. And he pointed out the fact that <laughs> he'd been someone who had discovered plutonium, and that's what it was. But that was the first time I'd heard about plutonium. He, my, uh, Joe really believed in security and not violating any of the rules concerning it. So uh, I had been kept in the dark about plutonium until that instant. Was it a secret when he yeah. discovered it in yeah. Berkeley? Yes, it was. it was a secret at Berkeley. So were, were you, um, I guess that was before you were married, you discovered it? Yes. Before you knew him, maybe? Yes, yeah. before I knew him. Uh, I was married in 1942. Before I graduated from Cal, I didn't get my degree. I was a junior, I, or, or I was an entering senior. 
when we left for Los Alamos. And I had to go back to school to get my degree. I got my degree at Wash U. After Joe died, I finished up so I could teach. And uh, so I graduated from Washington University in education. So when you had your first child at Los Alamos, Wade, yes. uh, how did you manage to work and have a baby? I didn't. I didn't work. As soon as I was uh, really pregnant, I stopped working. And then I didn't work after that. <clears throat> I stayed home and took care of the baby. Uh, there was another interesting anecdote about uh, babies at Los Alamos, General Gross complained, so so the story goes, <laughs> complained to Oppenheimer that why didn't he do something about these scientists, these young guys who keep having babies because it's costing the federal government an awful lot of money. They're having so many babies that they have to keep increasing the size of the hospital. <laughs> And Oppenheimer said that was not part of his domain. <laughs> the uh, Joe hired the doctors that came to Los Alamos. He hired them from Washington University, which is kind of an in interesting coincidence. Um, he hired three doctors. Uh, Jim Nolan was the obstetrician, and Henry Barnett was the pediatrician. And uh, um, Louis Hempelman was the radiologist. And then the nurses were also came from Wanshu. Sarah, and I think the other one was named Petey. She, her nickname was Petey, but I'm not sure about that. Sarah eventually ended up marrying one of the graduate students, Rene Prestwood, and he was from Cal. Berkeley. Petey ended up marrying the lawyer who took care of, uh, helped take care of the patent problem that uh, the, the plutonium discoverers had to fool around with. You know, they owned, they had a patent on plutonium and uh, they gave the patent to the government. So the four discoverers, co-discoverers of plutonium gave the patent? Rights to the federal government. They figured that not much was going to be done with plutonium for a while other than making bombs. And uh, as a source of uh, electric power, it, it would be far in the future. And it uh, seemed appropriate that it was better that the government took care of it. Without, in the end, or in 1955, the government um, reimbursed you. Yeah. Um, that, that reimbursement, I think, sort of turned into the Fermi Award. And uh, since that time, other scientists have received a similar stipend like that for doing outstanding work in science. I'm not exactly sure about all that. Um, so if you were, did you know Oppenheimer then? Yeah, and I met Fermi. Fermi was a very charming, friendly, personable individual. Um, I remember him talking to me 
about that when I was a postman, I was I was wearing rancher's pants and sweaters and stuff to fit into the seat. And uh, evidently I was wearing a red sweater. And Fermi said it reminded him of home. Uh, in Italy, the um, um, postmen wear red sweaters. <laughs> so I mean, that's the kind of charming guy yeah. He, yeah. he was. So did you go around the, the community door to door delivering the mail? No, it was taken to the to the post office in the tech area uh, and uh, delivered after that. That would be uh, that'd run you ragged. You had to if you had to go down to Santa Fe and back twice a day and then deliver. All no, of that, that would be <laughs> no a lot. Oh. Yeah. So did the the censors read the mail before they distributed it? I suspect as the mail probably was uh, censored again. I don't know or checked out. I have no idea what what took place about the entering mail. But the mail you had had it um, in a suitcase with a moth around your wrist. No, it was it was padlocked to my. It was just a briefcase, and it was padlocked to my belt. <laughs> that was you, that was the top secret stuff, the confidential stuff. The regular the regular mail was just in a big bag, regular bag mail bag. So did the uh, post office in Santa Fe ever give you funny looks? No. No? No. Do you think they mean. knew what was going on on the hill? Oh, they had no idea, supposedly, about what was going on up on the hill. There were, there were obviously, something was, it was a great deal of it, construction. And uh, Dorothy Kibben was running an, an office there in Santa Fe. Um, she was a fantastic woman. Uh, she was a, a Santa Fean, and she greeted everybody who was coming in from all over everywhere to when they first got there and told them where they were supposed to go and how they got there. So she was really the first contact to uh, the Los Alamos project. Um, she was an extremely uh, good um, woman, and everybody liked Dorothy McGibbon. She ran a good office. But uh, the Santa Feans couldn't help but know that you know something was going on because it was a big construction project. So on your days off when you went to Los Alamos, I mean once a month, uh, where, what did you do in, I mean, not Los Alamos, Santa Fe? Well, in the Santa Fe, well, we, we saved up uh, our um, requirements. I remember having to buy diapers, for goodness sakes, and they were scarce. Uh, my mother ended up sending me diapers from Berkeley. She was living in Berkeley, in California, and uh, uh, I, the, the diapers was in short supply in Santa Fe, uh, but we had, you know, we, we bought household things that we needed. Um, the uh, the business of of liquor was interesting. <laughs> Joe had to go to Chicago often um, to the Fairby lab. And when he was in Chicago, he would go to a liquor store and try to buy scotch, or but you couldn't get any of that at Los Alamos. But in order to buy a bottle of scotch, you had to buy a bottle of liquor, liqueur, or else they wouldn't sell it to you. So Joe would come home with a bottle of ghastly liqueur and 
<laughs> a bottle of scotch or a bottle of bourbon. And uh, you could get beer at Los Alamos, but you couldn't get anything else. And uh, Santa Fe was very, in very short supply of uh, alcohol. And it, it, it sounded like we were heavy drinkers. We weren't. We only time we had anything to drink was when we had friends over at night on a weekend, um, and we <laughs> we mixed up this ghastly drink out of to get rid of the liqueur. And I think the liqueur, it was sangria. Do you know what sangria is? It's very sweet. And we mixed that with maraschino cherries and a slice of orange <laughs> to make it palatable. Anyway, that was our drink. And for entertainment, we often had played poker on a, on a weekend. Uh, we, you know, we really, we were limited do what we could do. Um, so we had a foursome of poker. Art and Mary joined us, and I think two graduate students and Joe and I played poker and drank this ghastly drink. Um, so, so you played right along with the men? Yeah. Yeah. And other wives did too? This was a Yeah, Mary. Mary was a wicked poker player. <laughs> um, they had a movie theater there on the hill, and it was marvelous. It, it cost us 10 cents to go see a movie, and they were ch the movies changed often. Uh, well, they would, they showed a movie and a uh, Pathé News, and we went into this big building and sat on benches. To uh, and uh, that was a common entertainment for everybody there. They also had some horses left over from the boys' school, which was Los Alamos before we got there. Uh, for a while, we don't, they had horses only for a short while. But we we experiment, experimented horseback riding in the country. Oppenheimer was a great horseman because he'd been in New Mexico and in the Los Alamos area growing up as a young man, a young boy. He and his brother Frank. That's how, that's how Los Alamos site was chosen, because it was an area that Oppenheimer was familiar with. So do you think he made a good choice? Oh yes, it was spectacularly beautiful. We were up at uh, 7,000 feet on these mesas overlooking the valley and across the valley on the other side was the Sangre de Cristo mountain range, which was beautiful. It was a 14,000, the Truchas was a 14,000 foot peak, and uh, Lake Peak was 10,000. That was another thing that some of the scientists used to like to do. They used to like to hike those mountains. And uh, I even went up Lake Peak, which was 10,000 feet, uh, I was persuaded to go one Saturday by my neighbor, Liz, um, Betty Inglis. So there were three of us, four of us, <laughs> who hiked Lake P. That was quite an experience. To go to Taos. Uh, not, I didn't go to Taos. Oh, okay. That's too was too far. Not enough gas. Right. Um, I've been to Taos many times since because I have a log cabin in Colorado, and Taos is only ninety miles away. So it's very convenient to uh, 
go to Taos and have some fun. Um, so did you ever go to um, the tea house at Ottawa Bridge? Oh, you mean um, Edith Warner's yeah. house? Yes. Uh, Joe and I were invited by <coughs> by Hoppy to have dinner there a couple of times, and uh, she provided a fabulous meal. Uh, she was famous for her chocolate cake, and I think a lot of us left Los Alamos with her recipe on how to make Edith Warner's chocolate cake. <laughs> that it was uh, that was a fun experience to go there. I remember another place we went to, but I think it must have been after the war was over, Joe went back to Los Alamos for a consulting project in the summer, and uh, there was a place called the Black Swan ranch. I don't know whether that's still, I don't think it's no longer belongs to the owner who was sold for some other purposes, but it was a restaurant, a, a private home, a private ranch, uh, converted to uh, a restaurant and had a French cook. And the ranch itself was, was really charming, it's quite beautiful. We sat out on a terrace to have our drinks and had dinner in this Spanish adobe style home. Um, we went up to the Via Grande several times on picnics. I remember once going up there, uh, the Lipkins were with us, and their dog, Tito, which was an iris setter, and Wade was just a tiny baby. So the four of us uh, headed up to the Via Grande for a picnic, and we got up there just before, and that we were in the forest still, the, and amongst the pine trees and so on. A, Great bolt of lightning hit there beside the road, and out of the woods appeared a whole family of, I guess, Indians, and absolutely petrified. And uh, we were driving a two door Ford sedan, and there were already four of us in the car. <laughs> We piled four more Indians, at least four, in the car and took them over the ridge down into their, the valley on the other side of the Hamas and to their um, a reservation. Uh, we were always uh, getting um, storms. Uh, at Los Alamos. It was really vulnerable. I had never experienced lightning like that before. And in the summertime, a big storm would come up at noon, and you could almost set your watch by the first bolt of lightning. And uh, the lightning crashed around all over the place. It would last about 10 minutes, and then it was rained and poured, and then it was gone. <laughs> and that was it. But it was scary. <laughs> Did uh, Joe go to the Trinity test, or did you? Oh, yes. To Almogordo? Oh, yes. I, I did not go, of course. Only a certain number of scientists were allowed to go. I, I can't remember at what mile limit Joe was allowed 
was placed, I think he was placed at the 10 mile limit, but there was another, another group were placed at the five mile limit. Um, and they were handed um, glass, dark, dark, dark glass to use to look at the bomb when it went off. It was way too bright to see, uh, to look directly at it. Um, as a matter of fact, they were told to turn their backs to the site when it was going to go off. Um, I don't remember who was in Joe's group. Uh, a lot of wives found out what was going on, but my being the wife of Joe, he never said anything <laughs> about what was going on. But I know that everybody was leaving and that there was a big secret hoopty doo rowdy dow going on. And a lot of people went down, the wives went down and spent the night on the, the um, I can't remember the name of the mountain, it's outside of Albuquerque. They, they, they spent the night up there and they could see the explosion from the mountain. But a lot of wives, I say, were told what was going on, but I was, <laughs> uh, not Joe. He didn't tell me. I learned about the atomic bomb explosion when I was, I went home to Berkeley in August. When was the bomb dropped? I don't remember. Sixth and the ninth. Of August. The 6th and the 9th of August. Okay, I was in Berkeley visiting my parents, and of course it hit the newspaper, and that's when I found out actually what had been going on all that time. Did you just read the headline and instantly? Yeah, on the San Francisco realize? Chronicle. <laughs> yeah. So what was your conversation with Joe? Do you remember that? No, he, uh, I didn't, they, I admit there was no big deal about that. There was a big deal about having dropped a bomb. Later, Oppenheimer was very upset about the horribleness of the bomb. I was very concerned that the United States understood what had been created and he wanted to be sure to inform our country and the world just what had taken place and that it had to be the last time the bomb was ever used. He was very much concerned about that. He lectured on that, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, trying to make it known that that should be the last time the bomb was ever to be used. And of course the big problem arose with uh, Teller. Teller, during the period at Los Alamos, didn't want to make a hydro um, an atomic bomb, he wanted to make a hydrogen bomb. And he was very angry at Oppenheimer, that he, Oppenheimer did not go in that direction. And, and you, if you read, I don't know, the history and everything, Teller proceeded to be a very angry, selfish man. He was a Hungarian. Um, and caused Oppenheimer to be um, convicted of being an unsafe, individual and should not be allowed to be exposed to any more secret information. Uh, Joe testified in behalf of Oppenheimer in Washington. I don't know who else testified. Joe, Joe was a very good legal eagle. He was very, very well informed about the law because when he was a graduate student, at Lawrence, Kansas, to get his master's. He roomed with 
law students and picked up a lot of legal knowledge and was very, he played a very important role when the uh, plutonium patents were given up to uh, the federal government. He was a very good friend of the lawyer, and I can't remember his name. Von Neumann, you said? Hmm? He was a very good friend of Von Neumann, of, of whom I missed that. Hmm? I, can you say who he was a very good friend of? The name, I didn't hear the name. I don't, I can't remember the name of the lawyer. But he was a good friend of Joe's. He and uh, he Larry later married the Petey the nurse. He was he was a very pleasant lawyer. Evidently, Joe liked him very much. But um, uh, Teller was a, a very difficult fellow on the hill and um, his uh, a good friend of his, Hans Beta, who was also a Hungarian. They used to be very good friends, but Hans, uh, when this occasion occurred and Tiller turned on Oppenheimer, and Oppenheimer lost his ability to be cleared, uh, Hans uh, no longer was a friend of Teller's. Uh, Hans Bethe was a terribly nice fellow. Um, he got a he got a Nobel Prize for discovering what went on the sun, this this the sun cycle, the hydrogen cycle that keeps keeps the sun going. That's what he got his Nobel Prize on. I'm sure Rosa had a terribly tough job being housing uh, distributor. I'm sure a lot of wives complained about where they were assigned the house, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure she had a miserable job, but she, she survived. I can't. I'm sure there are many more things that I could remember. <laughs> when we left Los Alamos, it was a real tough problem. It was like Catch-22. It was set up so you couldn't leave Los Alamos until you had given up the army issue furniture that you were using in the apartment house. But you couldn't use, give up the ap furniture until you ha had a place to live. Well, it, Joe, was ha Joe was having a terrible time trying to get away from Los Alamos. We were headed to uh, Texas to visit his family in uh, Nacogdoches. <laughs> uh, um, I, oh, and we ran out of water at that time. The uh, pipes froze and we had no water and the water was trucked in by tanker. And oh gosh, it was rough. Then I had diapers to wash and there was a water shortage. And <laughs> it was difficult. The um, but anyway, I went to, I spent, we signed in to the Bishop's Lodge that first night and then took off for Nacogdoches. Um, there's some other, sometimes the, the cooking at Los Alamos was difficult. At 7,000 feet, you have to cook everything a half hour longer at that altitude. And, um, our cooking equipment was uh, 
really a problem. We had what we call black beauty stoves. They were great big old fashioned iron, black, wood burning stoves. And, uh, uh, and uh, but also we had a hot plate, a two burner small hot plate. The army thought that they could solve the wood burning part and they installed a aspirating uh, kerosene, I guess, or I don't know what, uh, some sort of a burner <laughs> to make a fire to heat up the oven. And Charlotte Serber was the person who uh, was exposed to the first uh, demonstration. and. Uh, it was frightening. None of us were about to use this aspirating, kerosene burning contraption that the army was going to install in the Black Beauties. <laughs> uh, then there came a time when uh, we were rationed for electricity and we were allowed a half hour of electricity in the evening to cook our dinner well, you can't cook potatoes in half an hour at that altitude. So it was awkward. And um, I remember Mary got from her family a pressure cooker. And that was a, a big help, a pressure cooker. And so I immediately wrote my mother, can you find me a pressure cooker? And she got us, got me one in Berkeley, second hand. <laughs> you couldn't get one new, but that was a big help. Did you have reading lights? I mean, if you had a half hour of electricity, yeah, in the to cook the dinner, then after yeah. that you just had candlelight, or what happened? You know, I don't remember. Well, then the, the um, I don't remember, Cindy. Um, we we must have had uh, electricity. Again, we all went to bed <laughs> after a hard day's work. Nobody stayed up very late. I don't remember. The, um, they had a hard time with the heating. Uh, there were furnace rooms in each one of these uh, army built buildings that we were living in. And the Spanish American guys were hired to stoke the furnace. And uh, there was some incidences where they stuck them, stoked them too hot just to the, so they didn't have to come back so soon to when uh, they set uh, the furnace room on fire. That was exciting. <laughs> um, I remember the furnace room, they burned coal and that soot used to pour out of the ventilators in your apartment house. We had, um, as a, as a housewives, we had uh, the Indian women coming up from the Pueblos to clean our house. Um, they were very charming and very pleasant. I mean, I remember the one that I had brought me a, a gift of one of Marie's faces from Samuel Defonso. And I was not with it to really appreciate the value of the, of the face. Uh, it got broken when it was, it was accidentally knocked off the coffee table and broke. I was not sensitive to Indian art and Indian crafts and so on until after I had left Los Alamos and went back. <laughs> and I then learned to appreciate uh, the uh, Indian uh, art. 
uh, coming from California, the uh, Indians of California were not as um, artistically inclined as the Pueblo Indians. Uh, I don't remember any pottery or jewelry coming out of the Indians of California. I'm sure they made some, but I was not impressed and uh, did not appreciate at all the rugs, the beauty of their rugs and uh, the beauty of their turquoise jewelry and so on until after the fact. Did you have a chance to see any Pueblo dances? Yes. Uh, went to an early dance at the San Ildefonso Pueblo. I believe it was the corn dance. And I had a wonderful photograph of, of uh, Priscilla Duffield and me at this Pueblo dance, but I can't find it. Priscilla was uh, Oppie's secretary. A fantastic gal. She was good. Uh, and I saw Priscilla long after the war. I probably have a photograph of her in my album on the, the on it on the um, in my album that it's about my cabin in Colorado. She came out to uh, Levito, where we a cabin is, and visited. Uh, she married Bob Duffield during the war. Bob Duffield were, was a graduate student, I guess. I don't know whether he had a PhD by then or not. At, Berkeley. I remember meeting him there. I met I met a lot of these. I met Art, and I met Dave Lipkin, and I met Duffield. I met some of these people at Berkeley before I got to, before I was married, before I got to Los Alamos. I met them when I was dating Joe. So there were a, a great number of people then that migrated from Berkeley to Los Alamos. Yes, a great many. But there were a great many foreigners. Uh, we had a Russian physicist gal. She was a white Russian. Uh, we had uh, the, the fellow who shared responsibility for chemistry um, in the tech area, who was a metallurgist, was from England, Cyril Smith. His wife was a very able uh, gal who uh, helped establish the high school there at Los Alamos. You know, they had, a lot of these scientists had children and they had, they had to set up a school. She was responsible a good deal for getting that school started. I think she taught English Lit. Afterwards, she was editor of the um, Atomic Bulletin. Alice Smith was her name. Um, they were from England. But there were Germans and Italians and Swedes. There were there's a great variety of people at Los Alamos. Uh, 
and most of, well, I guess you had a number that were part of the so-called British mission, like 19 sort of experimental physicists who came over with, uh, you know, under James Chadwick? Don't know. Yeah. Don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Hans Bethe, for instance, yeah. went to Cornell. I remember C. Gray had a hard time getting a decent job. He came from a very wealthy family in Italy, uh, had been working with Fermi at Palermo, the University of Palermo in Sicily, and uh, had done some important work then with Fermi. Um, his wife was German, um, Elfrida. Um, um, he tried to take uh, some money out of Europe for his inheritance and everything. At that time, you couldn't take, I mean, England was so, uh, the English people couldn't take more than something like $200 out of England at that time, and it didn't. It was just, it was just dreadful. They had no resources whatsoever. Um, C. Gray uh, bought a Leica camera, and he invested in some raw diamonds uh, and got those into the United States. As a, as, as a resource, but he had a hard time getting a job. He was given a lectureship, for heaven's sakes, and then finally got to Berkeley. I don't know what his uh, position was at Berkeley. I have no idea. The salaries the people got were the same as what they had been earning before they got to Los Alamos. So some of the scientists came as professors, but somebody like Joe came as an instructor, and his salary, salary was not quite big enough. And he was asked all the time to go to Chicago or on these trips. He was given a, uh, an allowance, which was a standard allowance for anybody traveling for the government at that time. I think it was $10 a day. It didn't quite cover his expenses when he had to go to Chicago. So I remember we always had to go into debt a little bit every time he came back from one of those trips. But the living expenses were very low. I mean, everything was army issue and uh, the rent, God, I think, I don't remember what the rent was, but it was very low. I must say that the apartments were very well designed. They were very comfortable. When I, I, when I had, well, when Wade was born, we had two bedrooms. There was a fireplace. The kitchen was quite good size, and there was a little a dining nook, breakfast nook off the kitchen. They were, the apartments were very well thought out. The, the Lipkins living below us at Los Alamos was a big help to me because I was, I was just 20. I was 22 when Wade was born. And uh, Joe would have to go to Chicago or I suppose, uh, to Oak Ridge or Hanford or wherever, but usually to Chicago. I was very lonely and the Lipkins were extraordinarily friendly and um, neighborly and warm-hearted and uh, made sure I was okay during these absences. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was in, when I knew that Wade was going to be born, I was in labor. Joe was in Chicago. And Dave Lipkin walked to me to the hospital early in the morning. <laughs> so you walked to the hospital? Oh, you walked to the hospital. It wasn't very far away. Another nearby neighbor was Captain Parsons, 
you know, Captain Parson. He was the representative of the Navy there at Los Alamos. And um, he was given a, one of the original houses to live in. And uh, he lived very close to where we were. There were a few row houses that were the envy of everybody, <laughs> but there were only about three of them or something. Uh, left, you know, they were the houses of the professors of the boys' school. And it was called Bathtub Row. Have you heard this? <laughs> because they had bathtubs. Tell, tell us about um, how you came to St. Louis. Well, um, Compton uh, took the job of chancellor of Washington University when the war was over. Compton was in Chicago, and uh, he was kind of a liaison guy during the war. He toured around between the th three sites, uh, coordinating efforts and stuff. Um, anyway, he took this job at uh, Wash U, hoping he'd gotten his he'd gotten his Nobel Prize when he was at Washington U. I think he'd done the work there, but, uh, but of that I'm not positive. He'd worked on cosmic rays. I don't remember whether that's where he did the work or not. I'm not sure. But anyway, he had a vision of WashU becoming a good Midwest university, that St. Louis could afford it, and it was in a good location. The United States could use a good university in St. Louis. So he felt that was quite a challenge. And he asked Joe, if Joe would come and start up a chemistry department. The fellow who was head of the chemistry department was what you call a beer chemist. He was supported by Anheuser-Busch and was much more interested in beer, I think. <laughs> anyway, he was called. Anyway, he was ready to retire. So anyway, Compton persuaded Joe and this other fellow that worked with Compton Look at Joe brought. Uh, Jill brought the books uh, that Joe was author of. Is it over? Here? This book? Yeah, not that. No, no. Different book. No. Okay. The chemistry book. Okay. The first, the first issue was dedicated to this guy. He was a wonderful fellow. These are great. No, no, the other one. The, yeah, that one. Look in the frontispiece and you'll see the dedication. Joyce? Clark. Yeah, Joyce Stearns. Yes. He was from Colorado. And uh, Joe became very fond of Joyce Stearns. He died soon after of cancer. Um, but anyway, Joe was challenged. He'd been offered an awful lot of jobs when the war was over. He was offered a job at Harvard and he went to visit the, one of the departments of chemistry. And he came home and said, Adrian, you would not like Harvard. <laughs> anyway, but he was also offered a job at, with Monsanto, he was offered a job at Stanford, he was offered a job, he was offered a job all over everywhere. But he was challenged by the Wash U deal. And he was able to persuade a lot of these other Los Alamos guys that were with him to come to St. Louis too. So he started up with a very good department of really able fellows who were equally excited about establishing a good chemistry department. They were all able. I mean, Sam Weisman was a very bright guy who worked with um, a spectrograph, mass spectrograph. Don't ask me, Duendo. David was an organic chemist. 
did some good work. Lindsay Helmholtz uh, came from Dartmouth, and he was a physical chemist. Um, Art, Art Wall took over the radio chemistry, the uh, nuclear chemistry, and Monsanto offered to build a little nuclear lab on the campus, which was the first expansion building that WashU had. So uh, Monsanto was responsible for that. Charlie Thomas, who was head of Monsanto, was from St. Louis. Uh, he wanted Joe to take over the Dayton plant, but Joe was not about to do that. Joe wanted to stay academic. Um, but anyway, Charlie Thomas saw to it that this nuclear lab was constructed, and that's where Art hung out during his stay at, at, as, as a professor at WashU. That was his hangout. Um, The, um, Joe was promised a new building. The um, campus had a building that was built during the first, um, during 1904, the World's Fair in St. Louis. Uh, the, in fact, Wash U was built during that world, that period of the World's Fair. <clears throat> the main building, Brookings, and uh, anyway, Bush Hall was built then, and I don't know what the library, I don't know what all. Um, anyway, Joe was promised a building, and he had not been there too long before they got enough money to construct Louderman Hall. And, um, it was needed badly. So that was great. Oh, the Washington U has changed tremendously. It has expanded like you cannot believe. You cannot believe what has gone up on that campus Every square inch now, practically, has been built upon with a new law school and a um, fabulous uh, um, well, I can't, I can't tell you the. Uh, A building it has to do with promoting the use of uh, computers and things has has been constructed. It's it, it's it's expanded in the most remarkable way. And so is the medical school. I'm sure the medical school's doubled in size. So, um, what, you know, obviously he had a, a, a brilliant career as a professor. Yes. He loved being a professor. He, he was a bit of a ham. He was a very good speaker and very funny. He had a Texas sense of humor, a, a good storyteller. And he really, he enjoyed, he taught freshman chemistry, lectured in freshman, well, and also he had a graduate class on, in nuclear chemistry. But uh, he really enjoyed teaching. Um, he had a fabulous sense of humor. <laughs> the typical Texan ex exaggeration. He always said his stories were true. <laughs> The town of Nacogdoches was tiny. 
and uh, they now have a building named after him at the uh, uh, Stephen F. Austin uh, State Teachers School. That's where he graduated from college. He graduated in three years and went to Lawrence, Kansas, and then to Berkeley. He got his PhD at Berkeley. So what was the difference in your ages? Five years. Four years. I was 20, and I guess he was 24 when we were married. 19, we were married in 1942, so 17. No, we were married when he was five, uh, 25. I guess during World War II, there were a lot of people getting married very young. Yes. So did you get married in California? Or? At, yeah, at home in Santa Barbara. It was, it was a strictly a wartime arrangement. Um, just, just my uh, older sister, uh, who was married to a physiologist at Berkeley, um, they were able to keep Smith, his name was Smith, Bob Smith, he was in the Navy, an ensign, and uh, was working at Cal for the Navy, doing something entirely different from what he was studying for his PhD. Um, he got his PhD under the auspices of the government. I don't remember whether he got it at Cal, I think he did. But it's an entirely different subject from what he'd been studying. He had been studying Tritorus terosus, which is a kind of salamander that, does, that is very rare and occurs in the Berkeley foot hills. <laughs> and he'd been studying this salamander for some time, uh, at writing his, doing his research. And um, that was dropped entirely when he got uh, enlisted in the Navy. And he proceeded to study, I don't know what, when he was in the Navy. Barbara, my sister, worked in the radiation lab. She first worked for an obstetrician in the zoology department. But then uh, she was sent up to the radiation lab where she worked on the project there and was doing uh, secret work. And then, I guess Smith must have been transferred to NIH. Anyway, they ended up in, in um, Maryland at NIH working there during the war. So look, did Joe, I'm sure he was asked this, and, and you, um, what have you thought about uh, or the, uh, your role in developing the atomic bomb? What? Ha has, um, did Joe talk about or um, you know, write his thoughts about having been part of developing the atomic bomb? And yeah, well, they, all of those guys at Los Alamos talked about that. They were all so, uh, they, the, the project was so important and, and they were so anxious to solve the problem. And believe me, those Europeans were super anxious because they knew that, they thought they knew that the Germans were 
working on it too. But it turns out that they weren't. But anyway, they felt it was imminent and that they had to get this project solved. And they, that's, they just worked ever so hard. They, uh, they, they just dedicated themselves really to the project. And afterwards, they were um, overwhelmed by the result. And there's, I think there's a chapter in Joe's book about peaceful uses of atomic energy. Uh, they tried to think of what they could do, you know, with this terrible thing that they had let loose and uh, how they could possibly control it. Um, there were a lot of there were a lot of uh, discussions. And they were, they you know a lot of complaints. Why did you drop two bombs? I asked Art Wall uh, that question, and he said it was because they thought the Japanese would not believe they had more than one bomb, and and that is why they dropped a second bomb. The the bombs did not cause as much damage in Japan as the fire fire destruction of Tokyo, for instance, and the big cities. The fire bombs did kill many, many more people than the atomic bomb. Other pe people don't realize this. Well, I mean, the whole thing was horrible. No excuses or anything. But, um, no, and you know, the um, a, a group of scientists were formed that were opposed to the atomic energy bomb. And uh, they they wrote and campaigned and lectured and stuff against it. And what can we do? There was a lot of discussion in that way. And uh, as I say, Appy himself was highly distressed and uh, wanted to get the word out that there had to be. A control. The United Nations was formulated in San Francisco at one of those meetings in an effort to uh, try to have some control over this. Joe was on the uh, Joe was on the scientific advisory board of um, Eisenhower when he was at Wash U. Scientific Advisory Board, that was all secret stuff. But um, General Doolittle Little was on the board, and uh, the guy who was head of MIT, Wilson, I'm not sure, Wilson was on this board. And, uh, uh, Land, the guy who invented Polaroid Land cameras, was on the board. Um, well, I'm sort of I've sort of exhausted my memory. He, Joe, was Friedlander. Friedlander was at Los Alamos during the war, terribly nice fellow. And he was in the chemistry group. Um, he and his father escaped Europe before the Nazis did such terrible things in Germany. And his, his father had sense enough to go get out of Germany, and they went to England. And then Friedlander came to the United States, and uh, he ended up at Berkeley as a chemist. Um, and then went to Los Alamos. He was, I don't remember him at Los Alamos. I don't know where he went. He went to Brookhaven afterwards. Terribly nice guy. 
Anyway, they wrote the book together. <clears throat> so Joe died of cancer? Yes. Died? Yes. He died of the same cancer that his mother had. It was cancer of the stomach. And he said, it did not have anything to do with the fact that I was working with something radioactive. Uh, so he wanted me to be sure to understand that. Um, um, it was a genetic thing. His mother had the same kind of cancer, carcinoma of the stomach. And uh, it was a terrible tragedy. He was 40 years old? He was just, hadn't quite had his 40th birthday. He was just about to have his 40th birthday. He hadn't quite had it yet. So he was still 39. 